I uh, read this letter a while back. I thought it was good, or a little article. Uh, a dad is uh, passing by. He's got a 15-year-old son, and he's passing by his, uh, his bedroom, uh, and he noticed on his desk uh, a sealed envelope, and it says, To Dad, on it. So he goes in, and with a little fear and, and trembling, doesn't know what this is all about. It's not Father's Day. This is just a, an afternoon. He happens to go by. He opens the, uh, the envelope with trembling hands and, and begins to read. Uh, Dear Dad, it's with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing you. I had to elope with my new girlfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with you and Mom. I've been finding real passion with Joan, and she's so nice. I knew you would not approve because of all of her piercings, tattoos, tight motorcycle clothes, and the fact that she's much older than I am. Uh, I'm not just her passion, Dad. She really gets me. Joan says that we're going to be very happy. She owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood, just enough for the whole winter. We share a dream of having many children. Please don't worry, Dad. I'm 15, and I know how to take care of myself. I'm sure we'll get back to visit someday when you can get to know your grandchildren, your son, Chad. P.S. Dad, none of the above is true. I'm over at Tommy's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are things worse in life than the report card that's in my desk drawer. <laughs> I love you. Call me when it's safe to come home. <laughs> A kid that that smart should be getting good grades there. I, so. I, I read, uh, saw a bumper sticker a while back that said, uh, insanity is heredity. You get it from your children. <laughs> and uh, sometimes that's the, uh, that's the way it is. But uh, again, being a dad, there's tremendous power, tremendous significance. And one of the books we went through with the guy some time ago, Stu Weber, in his book, uh, Tender Warrior, uh, writes the following about the power of being a dad. He says, like no other person, a father possesses a special power to mold another's life, shape it, give it form. Concepts of character flow from this man's life, esteem, principles, identity, and anchor points. When you think about it for a while, there are few things more powerful. And then he goes on and quotes Ken Myring, who is writing uh, an article in Men's Life, who says this, when the father is an active believer, and that's a, certainly a qualifying term, an active believer, there is about a 75% likelihood that the children will also become active believers. But if only the mother is an active believer, this likelihood is dramatically reduced to 15%. That's kind of a shocking statement. And what it does is it, it, it uh, certainly both mom and dad share this tremendous responsibility of raising, raising the kids. And in terms of hour and impact, mom is with those kids a lot more. But it says a lot about <coughs> the power that God has entrusted to, to a dad and the influence that he can have uh, one way or another. So let's look at our text, and I'm going to start at, uh, at verse 1, but uh, the, the kids don't have to worry. I'm not really going to deal with them. We're just going to start at verse 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live a life long in the earth. And you fathers, here's our verse, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training in admonition of the Lord. So there's positive instructions and negative instructions for, for dads here. Let's look at the, uh, the negative ones. And uh, note first that they're specific to fathers. Uh, it's not, uh, again, uh, Paul could have used a term meaning parents. Parents don't provoke your, your, your children, but he, he doesn't. He, uh, he, he picks out that it's the dads, that it's the, the fathers. Uh, why? I think the obvious uh, answer is that God is going to hold the dads responsible for, for the children. Uh, uh, they're the ones with the authority in, in the household. I think also because much of parenting comes natural to, to moms. Uh, they're more intuitive. They can read the kids more. They have a better understanding of what's going on in their, their hearts and minds uh, so many times. So even though dads have this tremendous power and responsibility... I want to at least suggest that dads ought to be listening to, to their wives when it comes to where their kids are at and how they need to be spoken to and, uh, and so forth. We, we need a lot of help. We need a lot of advice. 
we need a lot of uh, uh, counsel. I have in my notes now to repeat all that one more time to make sure we get that. I won't do that, but, uh, but it's very, very critical. Uh, uh, we have, us guys, have a lot of responsibility and a lot of power based on that, that quote that I read. But at the same time, we, we need a lot, of, a lot of help. One of the things that I'm really thankful for <clears throat> is that we didn't have our kids until after I got saved. And um, I know that it would have been very different otherwise. Uh, it was after we got saved, and it was after we had actually, um, when Kathy was uh, pregnant with Melissa, then it was the, okay, we've looked at some churches, but now we've got to find a church, you know. There was this, you know, this impending fear, you know, the, uh, of responsibility that, you know, we've got to find a church, and we've got to find a church that teaches the Bible because something's going to change in our, our lives, and there's going to be a tremendous responsibility. I, and I know the uh, same for uh, probably a, a, lot of, a lot of you guys, a lot of, a lot of families here. Boy, that's the, okay, now's the rubber meets the road kind of a thing. Uh, me listening to some guy on the radio or watching a TV program once in a while that somebody that's a good preacher is maybe going to get me through a little bit. But man, when it comes to raising my kids, I, I want them brought up uh, knowing the Lord and brought up knowing, uh, uh, knowing their place in terms of um, the, the counsel of God and being with other believers. So dads need advice and we need counsel. The instruction is specific to father. Secondly, the instruction uh, is a warning not to frustrate uh, children. We're not to provoke our children. And uh, the, uh, the text is, uh, uh, just to tell you, it's, in a, in, uh, it's an indicative, which means it's a statement of fact. So the, it's saying that, that this happens. It's not like, in case this happens, then stop doing it. It's saying, stop doing it. <laughs> it's saying that dads, fathers, men, have a tendency to provoke or frustrate their children and the way they speak to them and their behavior. And Paul is saying, stop it. And, uh, and so let's look at this. It's, uh, I think it's a critical thing. Now he says similar in Colossians 3.21, fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. It's the same, same word there. Uh, they become frustrated. Uh, they can become discouraged just in the way because they look up to us so much. Our words are so important uh, to them. Uh, it's so easy for us to, uh, to discourage, to frustrate our kids. And, um, and they then become resentful, and they then become rebellious. Frustration, I think, can be broken into uh, two categories. Fathers can be harsh with their children and frustrate them, and fathers can be um, indulgent with their children and frustrate them, and both, both are bad, just like, hey, anything goes. You know, uh, that's, that can frustrate kids tremendously. Or to be incredibly heavy-handed can be frustrating as well. So let's look at what it means to be harsh. One is uh, to be unreasonable. Asking things of, of a child's ability uh, that is just beyond what they can do in terms of their, their age and their maturity and, and where they're at. Laying, laying so many demands on them that life becomes frustrating to them because it's literally impossible for uh, for them to be able to live up to some kind of a standard or what you're expecting uh, of them. And it, it becomes frustrating. And, uh, and sometimes we can actually set our children up for success or failure. And sometimes it's, uh, it's for failure. We, we put them in the wrong places at the wrong time with too much responsibility. Uh, and we need to be careful. We, we expect too much. We're unreasonable. There's where we might need to be listening to our wives a little so we understand what, uh, what, what our child is capable of based on their age and maturity. Secondly is fault finding. Uh, this in includes being sarcastic or being demeaning. And uh, if, you're, uh, if, if, if you're not around it and you don't do it and you hear it in the shopping center, sitting in McDonald's with your kids, uh, it's, uh, boy, it, it kind of makes, uh, makes my blood boil. I tell you to hear somebody saying, hey, stupid, I said get over here. It's just like, <laughs> it's all I can do to not get up and, and say something. But, I mean, it's not my business, you know, unless somebody's asking the question. But people say things like that in public all the time. It's done in the media all the time. 
right? I mean, that's, that's the media. The typical sitcom today is parents are stupid and kids need to be able to say whatever they want to say because after all, it's just sarcasm upon sarcasm and it's all done for fun, for the sake of fun. And we can kind of get used to, uh, to, uh, to hearing it. There's a proverb that talks about be careful who you associate with. And, and, and when the things that we watch, we are associating with that family on television, you know, once a week for an hour or a half an hour or whatever it might be. We need to be very careful. We can think that that's the acceptable standard and become sarcastic and, uh, and demeaning, uh, very, uh, very destructive. Uh, neglect is another way. We see this certainly in the life of King David and, uh, and what it did to him. Uh, David was a, a great man of God in many ways. He was a terrible father. Uh, and it uh, doesn't help to have a bunch of different wives. But when you, it, it's, it's certainly a, a greater challenge when you have the blended family and so forth. There's just uh, other demands that are, that are there that are, that are more difficult to keep things in balance. Uh, and David basically, we know the story eventually, his son Absalom re- rebels against him and tries to kill him and take the whole kingdom over. Neglect is, uh, is certainly one of those things that's very prevalent in our, in our culture and our society today. Inconsistency. This is a big one. Saying that you'll do something and then never fulfilling your word. The fishing trip that's never taken uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, it's, yeah, we just got to be more, uh, more, more consistent. Hey, emergency come up and so forth, but uh, we need to be consistent uh, with our word to our, to our kids. A Harvard medical study said that uh, no other effect upon a child's self-worth was more damaging than that of a father being harsh uh, with, his, uh, with his children. And, uh, and I can tell you, back when I was uh, coaching, not, not so much uh, the high school kids, but uh, when I was coaching little guys in baseball, <laughs> and I did from like seven and eight and then nine and 10 and stuff, and and uh, within the first day, I, I could tell you pretty much what things were like at home. I had some kids that I called them the yes sir, no sir kids. Not that they'd really said yes sir and no sir. I think they only do that in Texas still. But, uh, but, uh, but at least they look at you, they look in the eye, they're respectful and so forth. They've been trained at home to fear adults a little bit, respect them and so forth. And I could tell that uh, their parents say it and then they expect it, you know, obedience the first time and so forth. And I'd have a few, a few of those kids <laughs> at a 15, two, and uh, mine and one other. And then, uh, but then there would be the, the whole other group of kids that were somewhere in between that I could say, okay, everybody run over. We're going to line up on this line. It's like a couple of the kids. I said, we're going to run. And pretty soon it's like, hey, I said, get over it. Okay, now we're going. It's like, okay, that's how that kid was trained at home. He does not respond unless he's being screamed at. And unfortunately, then I got to scream. If I screamed at this kid, Johnny, like that, this kid would be shaking in his boots and never come back to baseball again. This kid is not even phased by it. He's like, oh, okay. And now he's, because he's got trained that way. Uh, and that's, that's not what we want with our, uh, with our kids. Uh, we just want that, that, that response uh, that understanding of, uh, uh, of authority. Harshness can do that. The harshness of the voice, the words that we choose, uh, the inappropriate settings uh, that we might choose to, to punish our kids, always private, never meant to embarrass, never want to embarrass your kids. Uh, these are just things that are so important. So when Paul says, uh, fathers in particular, you have a tendency to provoke and frustrate your children he says stop it because that's it's almost like you're you're just a guy and uh you're going to have a tendency to do that so uh, you need to develop a whole different sensitivity to to kids and uh in and where they're at uh the other extreme of course is to be indulgent what does that uh, that mean well it's the, the child that has no no boundaries and uh again it's it's like the uh, kids are like the night watchman the night watchman, when he's going around the shopping center, the security guys, they're, they're checking doors, right? They're checking doors to make sure they're locked. They don't want them to be open, by the way, right? They're just making sure they're, uh, they're, they're locked and everything is okay. And that's what a child does. He goes around and once in a while he'll check a door if I can get through it. And he may think or say he wants to go through that door and do something, 
but actually he wants to make sure that door is locked and that he can't go through there. And he wants that security in his life. He wants some, to know that somebody else is saying, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Yes, you can only do this. Yes, we'll do this together. No, you can't go there. That's what it's actually a child wants. It's very interesting, the, uh, the conversations you can have with kids uh, about this issue. Uh, there's uh, uh, kind of a classic uh, experiment that uh, psychologists have done on more than one occasion with children on a playground where there's a, a fence around the playground. And they'll, they'll watch them go out and play and all the toys and the gym and all that stuff is all out there for them. And they'll uh, go out there and have a good time. These are like four and five and six year olds. And uh, they'll watch them for several days. Uh, and then they'll overnight take the fence down and then send the kids out to play. And it's a different atmosphere. The kids are now huddled in the middle of the playground. And they're not running around and playing ball because that fence is not there anymore that provided protection and provided security. And they wanted to know that it was there. And when it's not there, that freedom, that freedom just brought tremendous insecurity uh, to the kids. Uh, those are some of the things that happened when we're the other way, completely uh, indulgent. It's the child that grows up spoiled and immature as an adult. They have a tendency to be self-centered and only care for them uh, for themselves. They're given too much power in, in decision making too early when they're not capable of making decisions, choosing what TV shows they'll watch, what movies they'll see, what friends they'll have, what hours they'll keep way before they, they have the, the maturity to be able to, uh, to, to do that. And um, and to, to those kids, uh, you know, when I would come into contact, and, and then some of them even with, with high school, because kids can be turned around and they actually want the authority in, uh, in their lives. And uh, on more than one occasion, I would have <laughs> moms or dads show up for their kids after a, a practice and say, hey, it's time to go, hey, uh, you know. And I'd see the kids still playing around or messing around. And I would have to go over to them and turn my back to the parent, because I don't want to embarrass the parent, and I would say, listen probably won't use quite the verbiage that I would use at that time. I would say, you, you get over there and be, obey your, your dad right now, or you're going to pay for it the next time I see you. I'm going to run your little legs off, and you won't believe how many push-ups you're going to do. You get over there right now. The next time he comes and calls you, you go immediately. Do you hear me? Yes, coach. <laughs> and I would, but it was sad because they would obey me, but, you know, not... The, their parents because there was no security there. There was no sense of uh, authority. <laughs> there was no sense of consequence uh, if, uh, if that uh, obedience wasn't going to be there. I don't know if you remember, there's a great movie, classic movie, Remember the Titans. You know, Denzel Washington, true story. <clears throat> a friend of mine actually was in one of those high schools during that time period and kind of experienced all that. Uh, I saw him after seeing the movie and it was playing and he, he was kind of in tears. I think I was a little bit too, but it kind of brought the whole thing back to him. But remember, it was a, a time of uh, a bringing Denzel Washington takes over what had been a traditionally um, head football coach in the South. Uh, obviously, he's a, he's a black guy and there's some friction above it. And uh, he's trying to bring uh, kids that are black and white together on this same team and get them to work together as a team and so forth. And they're getting ready to leave for, uh, for summer camp. And um, the uh, two of the main stars are, are out there, previous football stars that are out there, and they're kind of horsing around and, and joking around when they should be getting on, on the bus. And then he, he goes up and gives them the Who's Your Daddy speech. I don't know if, you, if you've seen the movie, remember that. <laughs> he comes up to them and says, uh, and they're all horsing around, and he makes some sarcastic remark uh, about uh, what comedians they, they are and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And then he, then he gets real stern and gets in their face, <laughs> turns the back to the parents and looks them right in the eye about this far away and says, and says who's your daddy? And they don't, they don't know really how to respond to that. They're, they're thinking that he's that guy over there, <laughs> you know, with my mother. And uh, he goes, no, he's not. Not today and not now when you step foot on that bus. Who is your daddy? And what he's mean is, who is the authority over your life at this point? It's a great, great scene. I, I look for it to try to get a clip of it, but I, I couldn't find it in time. But uh, 
uh, it's just a great line. And I, it's, uh, kids need authority uh, over their life. And of course, they eventually say, Coach, <laughs> these big, tall, white kids looking down at Denzel Washington, Coach, you're my daddy. He goes, that's right, now get on the bus. <laughs> and uh, things begin to change at, uh, uh, at that point. Negative instructions uh, for raising kids, important for us guys to hear and be reminded of. And, and again, we're at all stages. I'm a, uh, my kids are raised, and I'm at the, grand, the grandfather stage. But uh, important to hear these things. Important that we know about them because we're going to keep at it, training a, another generation, seeking to influence others. Uh, when, we hear, when we hear that, that which can frustrate our kids, uh, from our kids to our grandkids, it's still, you know, it's an opportunity to, to teach and, and to mentor. Uh, secondly, there's positive instructions for fathers. Uh, the first instruction, notice, is to bring them up. This means to nourish or feed. Uh, it's the same word used in uh, chapter 5, verse 29, for feeds and cares for. As uh, Paul says, he who uh, loves his wife makes that comparison uh, feeds and cares for in terms of his own body. He loves her like himself. Uh, the idea here is gentleness and friendliness. Therefore, we need to be tender and close uh, with our children. Article from several years ago from Chuck Colson on his Breakpoint series says, uh, he says, what does uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Albert Schweitzer, and G.K. Chesterton have in common? All of them were prominent Christians of the last century, but these champions of our Heavenly Father had something else in common as well. All had exceptionally close relationships with their earthly fathers. Uh, in his new book, Faith of the Fatherless, psychologist Paul Viss says he initially set out to examine the lives of prominent atheists of the last four centuries. He discovered that all had fathers who were weak, abusive, missing, or dead. Then he began to wonder, was it possible that what appears to modernize to be defective fathering simply reflected the social conditions of the time? To find the answer, Witz compared the family conditions of prominent atheists to those of prominent theists of the same period. What he found is startling. Every theist, those that believe in God, he studied, had a strong and tender bond with his father or with a father substitute. And as adults, these men came, became known for taking on the intellectual forces of atheism. There's a great contrast between the father that is tender and loving versus the one that is absent in terms of a person's relationship with God the Father. And uh, that shouldn't, certainly shouldn't be a, a mystery to us. Uh, are there, you know, God's not into statistics. Are there uh, examples of that? Sure, Pastor Bill, I mean, his mom was uh, <laughs> married, divorced several times, really never had that relationship. Obviously, he turned that around, a very godly man, and now we see the generations coming after him and his family, and Greg Laurie has certainly got that kind of a testimony as well. But uh, if we want our kids to walk with the Lord, which I can tell you in the final analysis is everything and everything else is meaningless compared to that when you're uh, in my shoes at this stage. Uh, it's all about having that tender, loving relationship with them. Second instruction is to train them in the Lord. And the word train here means to discipline, even by punishment. We might say it's a balance of love and, and limits. It's the same word that Pilate used to Jesus when he says, I will punish him and then release him. It's the same word, train. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. Or Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I... Um, uh, Kathy and I had a chance about a year ago to hear really one of the top uh, 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 child psychologists in the country who is uh, who's a believer, and he was here doing a, a series of lectures and uh, authored a number of books, and uh, it was interesting. He said that uh, basically if you want to know how to raise your kids, just do what your grandparents did. He says because for all of history, for all of time, and in all cultures, everybody raised their kids the same and raised them successfully. It changed in the West and in the United States in the 1960s 
where we begin to indulge our children and be concerned about things we shouldn't be concerned about and no longer taught them to fear adults, have respect for authority, and so on and so forth. And he made the comparison. He says, every time he meets a school teacher that is at least in their 80s, he always asks them one question, what grade did you teach and how many children were you in your class? And the typical response from the kindergarten, first, second, and third, most of them had 30, 35 kids in their classes. How many assistants did you have? None. Why would I need an assistant? Because all those kids were trained before they got there. They actually just taught them academics. Uh, the worst thing a kid would do is chew gum in school. You know, that was like the, the big radical crime of the day. It, it all stayed the same, all cultures, everywhere, all time, until the 1960s in this country. And the way maybe you got trained or raised up or, or raising your kids got uh, tremendously altered. But uh, part of that was the chastening. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not always joyful, it's painful, but afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of the righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So train in the Lord, setting a clear standard so that if the child breaks the standard, uh, he knows that uh, he has disobeyed. And when he does, he knows that he's guilty at that point, and he knows that that sin and that guilt separates him from his family to some degree. That's what sin does. Unless he is punished and forgiven, then he remains separated, and eventually it leads to resentment, and it leads to rebellion. You're not helping. You're only hurting the situation. Uh, and a lot of bitterness grows out of kids that are actually never, through dealing with that guilt, in terms of punishment, in terms of reconciliation and forgiveness, brought back into the family. The third instruction is to admonish them. This refers to verbal instruction, would include a verbal warning. It includes exhortation as well as teaching. And um, it's used in the Greek, uh, the Septuagint uh, of the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 3.11. Uh, there we're looking at Eli, who was the high priest at the time. May have been a great guy himself. Apparently, he was not a good father, and the Lord uh, mentions that here. Then the Lord said to Samuel, uh, excuse me, this is actually to Samuel, to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel, at uh, which both the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day, I will perform uh, against Eli. Again, Eli is the high priest. Samuel is merely the prophet or the spokesman. All that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever. Why would God judge the high priest's house forever? Because of the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile and did not restrain themselves. Uh, Eli's problem is that he knew about it, did nothing. Uh, Samuel's kids, by the way, didn't turn out so great either, but he dealt with it. He admonished them. He did his best to restrain them. Uh, raising children is not quite the same as... Um, as, uh, as raising, raising dogs. You can pretty much train your, your dogs. And uh, my oldest dog, uh, Golden Retriever, was 14. Uh, and I trained her as a puppy and through, she was maybe one and two. And I could still, at 14, go out there and put a training collar on her and uh, a leash and make a couple of quick corrections. Didn't move real fast, kind of had the arthritis and everything. But she'd pretty much obey me. Children are not like that. They grow up and become adults, and they have a free will, and they make their own choices. And God never holds you responsible for the choices your children make as an adult. He just says, do your best while you got them, and you're only going to have them for, uh, for a while. Eli's problem was he knew and, raised, and never did a thing, and he had a high priest of the nation of Israel, tremendous responsibility. Verbally, instruction, restraining them. When do we do that? Well, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And then, having, having your life now right with God and walking with the Lord, now in verse 7, but you've, you've got to get it together first, then you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk uh, of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you, when you get up. I think that's pretty much most of the time. 
<laughs> you kind of cover everything there. It's uh, once your relationship with the Lord is, is right, now, now, now you're in a position to teach your kids about the Lord as, uh, as well. But won't my child get tired of me preaching to him all the time? Who cares? <laughs> Parenting is not a popularity contest. It doesn't matter if your kids like you. Uh, that's, that's a really a good thing. To, I almost put that on a big overhead. Parenting is not a popularity contest. Uh, if, you're, if your kids think you're just great all the time, you're probably doing something wrong. You know, uh, that's, that's something to please understand. It's not a popularity contest. Uh, but again, our concerns is, is that they'll embrace Christ uh, as their Lord and, and their Savior and that their destiny is taken care of. And we don't need to preach at them all the time. It's uh, again, to train means to, to nourish, to care for tenderly, clear verbal instructions, including warnings, discipline when we have to, which cl- includes uh, uh, punishment. Um, but again, it's, uh, and I'll kind of cover this in some, some practical tips in, in a moment, but uh, looking for the opportunities just in daily life to be able to share with them. Uh, the fourth instruction is that we should be, all of this should be done of the Lord. It's been said that a child is like a flower. He or she can bloom or be crushed. It's very, very important. Uh, again, it's, uh, are, we, are we building them up or are we, uh, are we tearing them down? Uh, Ephesians, um, Paul says uh, earlier that um, no unwholesome talk should come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those that, uh, that, that listen. Uh, but again, uh, when, when we haven't, uh, done these things, uh, you know, what, what do we do? Well, you know, some of us are at the other end and got a little passage for you here as we close, but, uh, uh, it's never too late. I was, uh, at, when I was at the conference last week and I was talking to one of the guys from Maui and <clears throat> he had had a guest speaker that do a marriage parenting thing, and we use uh, that same guest speakers. We use his material for our, our parenting classes uh, here when we, uh, we do them. And he was telling me a story of um, a couple in the church, and they've got, uh, they've got some boys that were, uh, I'm going to guess, like 6, 8, and 10, right in, right in that range. Uh, and uh, he, knew <laughs> he knew from the Sunday school teachers that uh, these kids are a handful. And uh, we'll just let, let it go at that. And uh, so uh, uh, anyway, they came to the, uh, to the, uh, the parenting thing. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the mom shared with the pastor a few weeks later uh, what a difference it made in, uh, in their lives, uh, lives of their kids. She said, uh, yeah, we heard all that. We realized that we've been doing it all wrong. So my husband and I went home. We set our three, uh, three boys down and we apologized to them. And we asked for their forgiveness because we had not been training them the way that we should and the way the Bible said that we should. So we asked their forgiveness, and they said they forgave us, and we told them it's going to be all different now. You're going to obey the first time. There's going to be a consequence, and they, they laid it out clearly. This is a different house. This is a new day. And she says it was kind of rough those first three or four days, but she says our house is different today. It is completely different. I mean, it's amazing. I've heard other stories like that, how just in a few weeks things can be uh, can be, be turned around. <laughs> if you wait till they're 15, 17, and 19, that's a little different, but you, you got to kind of catch them in those uh, uh, earlier, earlier ages. Uh, but uh, it, it, can be, it can be done. Now, what if we are, um, our kids are not open to us communicating to them about the Lord? Because again, that is the most uh, important thing. Uh, when they get to be that 16, 18, 19, 20 out on their own, then it's just all about them get, getting saved. And <laughs> you just got to pray that they get saved. That's, that's when uh, all that behavior or whatever is going on can turn around. And uh, in the Bible, the, the man that is described at the time as the most righteous man on the earth uh, did this. And his name was Job. Uh, so it was when the days of feasting had run their course, Job 1.5, that Job would send and sanctify them, his children. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all, of his children. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Job got up very early and interceded every day for his kids. And under that uh, were uh, his relationship with the Lord, of course, that involved the Old Testament sacrifice and so forth. 
but um, that's, that's where it needs to be. If you've reached that point and, and say, why didn't you tell me this like 15 years ago? Uh, uh, well, it's never too late. Just continue to pray and continue to, to intercede. I wanted to go through real quick some practical suggestions. I, I can't give you a chapter and verse for all of these. These are just things that uh, I've either read or done or tried to learn over the years. Uh, the first one, uh, as far as dads, and certainly would include moms as well. Moms, you can listen so you can help remind dad. We don't have good memories, short-term memories. Uh, one is you need to schedule time with your kids like you would any other aspect of your life. It, uh, you can't wait for things to just happen or when you might get around to it. Uh, you pretty much got to schedule it and then uh, try to hold to the schedule. Hey, emergency things, you know, come up, but... By and large, you need to schedule it and, and then hold to that schedule. I love the quote from Charles Hummel who said, Not hard work, but doubt and misgiving produce anxiety as we review a month or a year and become oppressed by the pile of unfinished tasks. You know, the tyranny of the urgent. We can always get caught up in the urgent things and never do the things that we actually should be doing. You've got you've to schedule. That means that... Um, I mean, for me, that means that my, my lawn may not have always got mowed. My fence may have not always got painted. In fact, it's about ready to fall down right now. It's my summer project, so I, I know I'm going to get to it. But I've been waiting 20 years. The kids are growing. I'm going to fix the fence. Uh, just did the roof. See, I'm doing all this stuff I never did for 20 years. The house is caving in. We're, we're, we're on it. But, uh, but uh, I don't have my kids around anymore. See, I, I don't have any regrets. Uh, uh, about, uh, about some of those things because they come and go all very, uh, very quickly. You, you, you can't do it all. So you've, you've got to prioritize. And I would say you've got to uh, make time with your kids uh, a priority uh, in there somewhere. And, uh, you know, God will honor your commitment to your, uh, to your, your, your family. Uh, again, we had, uh, I, I can think of times when uh, we had planned a trip to uh, Kauai with the kids and we were going to stay... Uh, up at Koke in a cabin up there and so forth. And, and then right as we were um, getting ready to go, I don't know why this is always the case because it happened more than once. Right as we're getting ready to go, I got one of the biggest stained glass commissions that I, <laughs> that I got at, uh, at, at that time and uh, would have been several months income and so forth. And it's just like, and I had a deadline and so forth. And it would have been really easy to justify canceling that, that trip over there. But um, I have this little verse I kind of cling to uh, that is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things will be added unto you as well. And part of seeking the kingdom of God is, is how you raise your, your kids. So we, you know, we went, did the trip, had a just awesome time and, uh, and came back. And I, I still finished on time. I mean, it, it all got done. Uh, I worked uh, instead of my typical... 10-hour days, I worked a few 12s, and uh, in it all, don't always recommend being self-employed. If you're, if you're having th thoughts about being self-employed, come talk to Mark over here a little bit. He's still, he's still at it. It's one of those where you work twice as much and make half as much, but, oh, it's really satisfying, though. <laughs> Somebody said uh, something about the stained glass work and uh, doing bigger commissions and stuff, and, oh, it must be so satisfying and everything. I said... I think I'm pretty much over that. I think I'd just do this for the money because <laughs> I got bills to pay here. It's, it, there, there is that. It's in the back of your mind somewhere. But, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, there were times. Uh, uh, then, then my next biggest commission, probably the biggest one that any stained glass artist got in Hawaii in the last uh, 25 or 30 years uh, over at the Grand Hyatt on, uh, on Maui, I get a call from, uh, the gal that I'm working with and the owner of the hotel has flown in from Japan, uh, the architect, they want to have a meeting <coughs> that morning. My problem, I promised Josh, and he's like nine or something, I promised him we'd go kayaking that morning with Uncle Doug. Doug and Elizabeth still living in Lani Kai, and it's raining in Kaneohe, so I thought I had an out, you know, but uh, it reminded me that it rains a lot in Kaneohe and not other places, so why don't we call Uncle Doug and see what the weather is? Oh, okay, we can... Son of a gun, if it wasn't sunny in that one spot in Larikai, right there where we'd launch from. So I didn't have an out, and uh, I, had to, uh, I had to make a decision. So I, I, I called her back and said uh, uh, I couldn't make it because I had 
other appointments and I'm booked solid till about one o'clock in the afternoon. I didn't tell her I was taking my kid kayaking. I didn't think that would fly, you know, but I just told her that, uh, you know, so just take notes if they got any questions. I can always meet with the architect later, I hope, and, uh, and, and so forth. And, and she went, oh, okay, well, sorry, you can't make it. And we went paddling. And um, it was sunny only where we were. <clears throat> and th this, is, uh, this is gospel truth, right? I mean, right where we were, it was sunny, all the way out to the Twin Islands. And then we watched the big rainbow, because it's raining everywhere else. And then it was sunny all the way back in until we got to the beach. And I went, okay, I thank God that God, that uh, this really is the right, right thing to do. And that I can really trust you for, for the, other, the other things. But those, are, those are hard lessons, faith lessons. Uh, but they're important. They're ones that you don't regret later. Secondly, you should have an answering machine or... Or if your cell phones these days uh, to screen your calls, uh, don't let phone calls interrupt dinner time, prayer time, reading Bible stuff. Hey, emergencies come up, somebody's dying in the hospital, you know, I, I got to go. But if it's not an emergency, don't allow other people to dictate to you what an emergency is. <clears throat> because your kids will notice that everyone else then is more important than they are. If anyone can interrupt your time with them, then anyone else is more important than them. They, they get that. So use, you know, screen your calls. Use an answering machine. Uh, it's, it's not that you're at the beck and call of your six-year-old, but when you have set aside a time to eat and pray and read Bible stories at night, uh, don't allow phone calls to interrupt that. Three, uh, pray for your kids. You know, I've got a lot of shoulds. This is a must. You must pray for your kids and your wife on a regular basis. Pray for your children's salvation. And uh, try to lead them to the Lord as soon as you can. Three, four, five years old, six years old. Those, that's the time to lead your kids to the Lord. That's prime, prime time. Jesus talks about a childlike faith, and kids are, kids are really, uh, really open. And we had the uh, <coughs> five-day club down here for the kids this week going on. And I, I praise the Lord for that because kids are really open to the simple truth that Jesus died for their sins and they can have eternal life and go to heaven. Uh, yeah, lead them to the Lord as soon as you can. But that's what you want to be praying for from, from the time of inception, basically, uh, until the time they receive the Lord. Then you want to be praying for uh, their maturity, that they would go on and mature and have a, a love uh, for God's word. And then, if you haven't figured this out, you got to start praying for their eventual husband or wife out there somewhere. God knows where they are. <clears throat> and you can start praying for that. That would be a little nice to have like 20-some years into that before you meet them for the first time or they meet them for the first time. Because uh, that's the second most important decision they'll ever make, right? Uh, and uh, pray for that very, uh, very early on as, uh, as well. Fourthly, uh, try and teach your kids, again, through life situations. I, I mentioned this and. And this is, you know, when your kid strikes out at the baseball game or whatever it might be. And uh, we were at uh, Disneyland uh, uh, just uh, a week ago uh, with uh, our grandkids, which was a blast and, and everything. But uh, uh, I have this memory, and, I, and I've kind of run it by Melissa before. There's this, uh, how many have been to Disneyland? Let me show of hands here. Okay, that's, that's enough. Okay. You know, kind of over where, about where, Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted House and all that stuff is. From there, you can look out at Tom Sawyer's Island. And we were there one time with the kids when they were, <clears throat> when they were little, for example. And, uh, and uh, it was in the evening. And at that time, they had a whole laser light show they did over Tom Sawyer's Island, Mickey Mouse, you know, through the ages. But the, but the big attraction at that point that they were really pushing was uh, Mickey Mouse as the wizard, Right. And he cast and does spells and, and all this stuff, which is satanic, by the way. Did, did I need to mention that? But, uh, yeah, that's actually not a good thing. And uh, so all of this is, is going, going on. And, uh, and I remember uh, grabbing uh, Melissa and picking her up and sitting her on this little brick wall and, uh, next to a wrought rod, rod iron fence. And I've got Josh up on my shoulders, and i got him like one head here and one head here. And I said... I said, do you see, see Mickey out there? Who is he? Who is he pretending to be? He's pretending to be a wizard. He's pretending that he has powers that he doesn't have. 
He's pretending that he can change things and do things that only God can do. Only God is the creator. And he's the only one that has ultimate power. Now, that's not a very good thing, is it? But now watch. And, and once in a while, there would, uh, there would be these uh, spotlights that would sweep across the crowd. And it, I mean, this is like peak time, you know, like summertime. There are thousands of people there with their kids. I said, look at all the people. Look at all the kids. They're all being deceived, aren't they? They think Mickey, as a wizard, is a good thing, but he's not, is he? That's deception. They're being deceived. We're not deceived, are we? Because we know God, and we read his word, and we understand the truth. But look at all the people that are deceived. Do you see that? They're like, yes, Daddy, we see that. <clears throat> and to this day, I can stand Melissa in that spot, and I go, do you remember this spot? She's like 20, sorry, get 26, I think. <laughs> To run the numbers. She could be 27. I don't know. She's an adult. <laughs> under 30. Over 25. And I said, do you remember this spot? She goes, yeah. I mean, she was probably nine. But there's just these times. And I, and I, could, I could go on. Uh, we were leaving Nelson and Mary, uh, Nelson and Joanne's uh, Tuatasi's house out on the North Shore when they were still uh, here before they went to the Big Island. And uh, and uh, had a day out there and a bunch of folks and ate and, uh, and, um, and watched the Olympics. Uh, when we got to watch the, it was the Winter Olympics and there was a team of Samoans in the Winter Olympics. And we were there with Nelson and uh, <clears throat> a couple other fellows that um, were large Polynesian men that kind of went crazy while that was going on. It was, it was a fun day. We got ready to leave and it was a little lane and a power line had fallen and it dropped down on the road. It's kind of <laughs> doing this whole thing. It's like, wow. So I stopped the car a little short of it. And I said, now, kids, should I see how close I can come to that thing? I mean, that probably would electrocute us or something, right? Should I see how close I can get to it? No, don't, don't do that, Daddy. Well, what should I do? The other side, get as far away as you can. Okay, that, you think that's what I should do? Yeah, then don't... It'll, it'll kill us, don't, you know, like, no, I can see how close I could come. And we could get really close and probably not hurt us. And I go, kind of <laughs> go on like this, little, no, no, no. I said, that's, that's sin. That's the way sin is. Uh, it's when we see it, when we see it coming, we want to get as far away as we can, right? We don't want to live a life and see how close we can come to it without it impacting or infecting our lives. We want to get you know, it's like, uh, it cost me a lot to get that power line cut down so I can have that illustration. I want you to know. You can't make this stuff up. I'm just saying, you know, it's great if you can have family devotions and so forth. But uh, what Deuteronomy is talking about is in daily life, once in a while, there's going to be these, these, uh, these pristine moments where, where if you can... Uh, I dropped the ball a lot of times. I'm sure there was a lot of other stuff I could have said and done, but God will, God will bring these things to your mind if you're, if you're meeting with him on a regular basis and, uh, and you have the, uh, the opportunities that can really, really impact your, uh, your, your kids. Uh, five, you should have family meetings. As your kids get older, let them know what's going on. If uh, changes are, are being made, they shouldn't be shocked or hear things of dad's new job from the neighbor down the street or so forth. Communicate with your kids what's going on. And, and you can even let them have a vote when you're deciding. Of course, each of the kids get a vote, and then mom gets one vote more than the number of kids, and then dad gets uh, one more vote than mom, but everybody gets a vote and gets to participate, but uh, uh, let them know what's going on. Have your kids pray for you when needs are, come up and are appropriate, and we would do this a lot. I'd be going off to do ministry, teach a study, get down, get the kids to pray for me, leaving on a missions trip. Uh, let them be part of what's going on and you know, interact with you uh, spiritually, and uh, their, their prayers can actually be powerful. You should have uh, seven, a steady stream of information on marriage and family through good books, DVDs. And, and uh, again, if, if, you're not a, if you're not a reader, then just get the DVDs, whatever you got to do. Uh, there's some great uh, material out there. Eight, find activities that you can do as a, uh, as a family. And uh, uh, that means you don't get to do what you want to do anymore, <laughs> by the way. I didn't play golf for years because I couldn't. I worked like six and a half days a week, so I couldn't justify five hours on a golf course by myself, 
And uh, you just, uh, you know, if, if you've got that kind of schedule and you work part-time and have three days off a week, maybe you can squeeze it in or something. But uh, when your kids are little, I mean, you have an opportunity to build sandcastles and that, that goes away real, real quick. I didn't surf for years uh, either just because I did a couple of times and it just, you know, it's like, okay, see you guys. And I'd be out in the water, come back two hours later. Okay, time to get going. Did we have a good day at the beach? <laughs> I kind of figured that out, and of course, listening to my wife just a little bit, uh, that, that that probably wasn't going to work, and uh, and I'm glad that uh, I have no no regrets uh, over over uh, the times I didn't get to hit a little white ball around in the lawn, which is a very frustrating experience anyway, uh, and uh, all the, all the surfing that maybe I missed over the years, uh, you know, and we we found we found things, camping, kayaking, you know, we did all this stuff with the kids, and it was. Uh, it was a blast, and then when they got older, they learned to play golf and learned to surf, and all of a sudden, uh, we're doing the whole thing as a family, but it comes and goes very quick. I read this thing, uh, uh, I just I don't want to run too long, but I thought this was really creative. Uh, this guy, Keith uh, Severin, and his seven-year-old, they were coming out of a store or something one day and found a dime on the ground, and so the dad said, oh, that's like a treasure. He says, I'll tell you what, this is with a seven-year-old, for the next year, I'll commit to 15 minutes a day, and you and I will go treasure hunting. <laughs> and they did, just through the neighborhood, looking for treasure. Uh, at the end of the year, they, they collected um, $1,000 worth of treasure in their, in their 15 minute walks. Uh, a lot of loose chains, bottles, a silver necklace, uh, a golf bag pull cart. Uh, and, uh, but he went on to say that. Uh, it was uh, richer by far in terms of the relationship they had grown in. He says, it was nice to spend time with them, get to know him as they walked. They talked not about treasure, but about vacations, what's going on at home and school. They even dreamed up books they could write about their experiences of searching for treasure together 15 minutes a day. So be, be creative. Read to your kids. Uh, read those simple Bible stories, and, and I would encourage you to, to not stop, even as they get into those teenage years. If you can start reading them the, the Frank Peretti stuff, they'll be interested in, in that. Find age appropriate and uh, keep reading to them. And my, my kids are grown. They, they love that now. It's like, hey, let's read a book. I mean, I've been for years, I was always looking for that. They studied a lot during the school year. Uh, that was their job. You know, your job get A's. That's your job. You know, however long it takes every day, go do that. I'm going to do mine. Uh, and then in the summer we'll play. And, and uh, I'd always find a good book that we could read out loud as a, as a family together. And uh, to this day, they, they love, uh, love doing that. Uh, probably accounts for Josh being an English major and like, liking to read the complete works of Shakespeare. Not too many 24-year-olds uh, do that in their spare time, but uh, he does stuff like that. Date your wife. It doesn't cost much. Time is the important thing. How much of a difference can it make? This is kind of a great example. Uh, in colonial America, a man named Mac Jukes lived. There was a survey done of him and another man named Jonathan Edwards in terms of one was a complete atheist and made no emphasis on a relationship with God, and the other one was it was everything. Mac Jukes. Max was a man who didn't believe in the necessity of going to church, worshiping God. His descendants can be traced into the 1980s. From him came 1,026 descendants. 300 went to prison. None of his family line ever went to church. The average sentence was 13 years. 190 became prostitutes. 680 became alcoholics. The state of New York estimates spending $4 million working with the family of Max Jukes. The same year that he was born, Jonathan Edwards was born. Jonathan Edwards was one of those zealous in his relationship with the Lord in church life. He had 929 descendants that can be traced to him. 430 went into full-time ministry. 86 became university professors. 13 became university presidents, 75 became noted authors, 7 went to Congress, 1 became the vice president of the United States. The Edwards family did not cost the state of New York a penny, but in fact enriched, enriched the country beyond calculation. One father thought going to church and having a relationship with God was important, and the other one didn't. Kind of close with a, a paraphrase from James Dobson, 
heard it a long time ago, and uh, it's, it's just a paraphrase. But he basically said, if raising your children would be compared to singing a song, the issue is not whether you hit wrong notes or not. It's whether you're singing the right melody. You know, we're all going to make mistakes. But if basically we're trying to do the right things most of the time, it's, it's pretty much going to work out. But again, tremendous power. And just a dad, being a dad and, and showing up and reading, reading a Bible story with your kids and, uh, and praying with them will have a tremendous impact upon their life and apparently future generations as well. When I come to you, for I know you satisfy. I am empty, but I know your love does not run dry. So I wait for you, so I wait for you, I'm falling on my knees, offering all of me, Jesus you're all this heart is living for. Broken, I run to you, for your arms are open wide. I am weary, but I know your touch restores my life.